Langston Hughes is our subject today. Let, let's start with a poem you probably know. Uh, it's on page 687. It's, it's really the, the poem uh, for which Hughes is perhaps most known and was first known. Uh, he uh, composed it when he was 18 years old. Uh, it uh, is The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Uh, you can see that it's dedicated to W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, du Bois was the uh, um, important uh, uh, leader and uh, uh, speaker who was the editor of the magazine The Crisis, uh, which published this poem. Uh, and, and The Crisis uh, had a circulation of 100,000 readers, uh, at least, if not more, uh, and uh, uh, is in that way you know, quite a debut to have. <coughs> and it, it put Hughes immediately in a political magazine, in a race magazine, uh, and in some ways in a, in a popular magazine, not uh, one of the little magazines of modernism. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo, and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turned all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Hughes' speaker is a uh, particularized voice, an eye, uh, at the same time uh, that he is a general one, uh, the Negro. Uh, uh, the Negro speaks, as, uh, speaks of and for a people uh, as a representative figure. Uh, like Hart Crane, uh, Hughes returns to Walt Whitman. Uh, Walt Whitman, uh, in his uh, ambition to speak of and for America, uh, at the same time, uh, unlike Crane, Hughes takes on Whitman's versification, uh, he, uh, Whitman's ways of making a line, uh, his free verse, his uh, 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 paratactic style in which things are listed, as opposed to Crane's crumpled and condensed quatrains, <coughs> stanzas. Uh, here, the, uh, the relation uh, between the particular and the general, between the individual and a type, uh, is one of the poem's subjects. Uh, it is a poem uh, about knowledge, about identity, and about history, too. What the eye knows is rivers. Uh, we learn just a few things about those rivers. They are ancient as the world. They are primordial. They are even, it seems, prior to the human in this sense, prior to human blood, which conventionally is a way of representing race, of speaking about race. So the rivers are older, it seems, than any race, uh, and yet uh, they're also uh, an image of, uh, of, um, of racial blood uh, and, and uh, flowing. Uh, Hughes is, is um, he's writing about a universal from a particular point of view. <coughs> uh, the flowing of rivers is like the flowing of blood in the poem. Uh, and to know them is to know what is under or, or inside particular racial experience at the deepest level. <coughs>
Uh, in this sense, we, we might paraphrase that, that title. Um, uh, the Negro speaks of human life and history <coughs> uh, as the Negro has known it. Uh, it's a poem concerned with human life uh, and history, the very most general terms of experience from the particular perspective of the black speaker uh, and from the perspective of black experience. As the poem uh, goes on, uh, the rivers are named and, and localized in, in history. The Euphrates, <coughs> origin of civilization, and the site of the Jewish captivity in Babylon. Uh, the Congo, evoking Africa and its people. The Nile, site of the pyramids, those uh, archetypal human monuments uh, fixed in place and, and, and pointed to the sky and in that sense. Uh, counterposed to the flowing river. Uh, being the Negro here means knowing all of these places. Uh, the poem begins, interestingly, in um, the perfect present tense. Uh, I've known, I've known, my soul has grown. Uh, this is an interesting tense that evokes simultaneously uh, the past and the present. It suggests a past carried over and into the present. Then, in that third stanza, the poem shifts into the simple past. I bathed, I built, I looked, I heard. <coughs> uh, the Mississippi, the line about the Mississippi, continues this pattern but then in the middle of the line breaks out of it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. Uh, there, there's a way in which the, the story of, of Lincoln and the freeing of the slaves that Hughes gets to at that point uh, seems to uh, well break out of the particular and, and then uh, reach into this um, perfect uh, present tense uh, to uh, evoke some kind of ongoing um, experience moving from the past to the present again. And then uh, the poem uh, goes back into uh, that, um, that perfect uh, presence. Uh, there's a sense of uh, past action that is ongoing and, and active, uh, present uh, in the poem. Uh, the rivers, they are deep, dark, dusky. Uh, they also, at this pivotal moment in the poem, turn golden. Uh, the poem projects a, a view of black history in which to be black means simultaneously to be the product of black experience across history at particular moments, uh, 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 particular moments, particular times, and also involved in the uh, deepest uh, transhistorical meanings of the human. Uh, the journey that the poem uh, describes links different times and places, uh, and ultimately uh, white and black, when Lincoln, uh, America's white president, president, goes down to New Orleans uh, and resolves to end slavery. Uh, this is a, a remarkable poem. Uh, by uh, uh, a young man to to write. Uh, it's uh, uh, not not. Oops. Let me uh, let me hold off this uh, interesting photo for a second. Uh, this is a um, uh, picture of Hughes uh, at uh, uh, still uh, in the the uh, mid twenties uh, when his work was just being read for the first time. Uh, it, it's a remarkable poem, I think, for a young poet to begin with. Uh, you could compare it to other uh, early uh, uh, sort of inaugurating or initiating poems that we've talked about, such as Crane's Legend uh, or The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, uh, and, and other, other sort of entries into poetry. <coughs> uh, we could compare its vision of the past to to that which we find uh, in perhaps Pound or, or Eliot, <coughs> uh, which leads me to this general question of how do we place Langston Hughes uh, in this course? 
uh, and more generally, uh, how do we uh, uh, position the black language and experience in his work uh, in the general context of modern poetry? Where else, uh, where else in this course does the Negro speak? Uh, uh, have you seen black people or heard black voices uh, in, in other poems? Um, blackness figures uh, in Frost, interestingly, uh, as a kind of charged symbolic color, but uh, in a very generalized way that isn't linked immediately to race, although it certainly could be seen to in certain contexts. <coughs> Uh, you could say the same thing, I think, about Stevens, uh, although you do in Stevens encounter certain black figures, including the word nigger in one poem. Uh, there's, uh, there's no question, though, that uh, in, in Stevens, uh, in Frost, uh, the poetry uh, uh, doesn't aspire to, uh, doesn't pretend to uh, represent the experience of African Americans. <coughs> Uh, Marianne Moore, uh, whom we'll read uh, soon, uh, has a poem called Black Earth. Uh, when Ezra Pound read it, <coughs> uh, he wrote to her and asked, since he didn't know, he had never met her, was she Ethiopian? Uh, <coughs> this is a, a truly uh, crazy uh, question, uh, but an interesting one. Uh, in this poem, uh, Moore uh, speaks uh, about an elephant uh, and, and from the point of view of an elephant in ways that might seem to possibly uh, speak for black people, but only on the level of fable or allegory. Uh, Crane comes closer. Uh, if you turn back a few pages uh, to in your anthology to uh, the Crane section, the first poem uh, in uh, that selection is called Black Tambourine. Uh, that's on 607. Uh, that poem describes, uh, uh, again, a kind of um, symbolic, uh, generalized type of the black man as a figure trapped in what Crane called a mid-kingdom uh, in the popular imagination, a mid-kingdom between man and beast. Uh, uh, it Crane sees the, the, the black entertainer uh, as, a, as a kind of figure of the artist, something like his tramps, his wanderers, uh, Charlie Chaplin. <coughs> uh, Crane had initially intended to include uh, a se in, in the bridge a section that was to be a dramatic monologue spoken by a Negro porter uh, on a train. <coughs> uh, that uh, plan fell away, uh, but there are uh, still um, uh, traces of that intention in his uh, section of the poem called The River, <coughs> uh, which uh, uh, tries to uh, evoke aspects of, of uh, black experience uh, to integrate jazz, blues, spirituals into uh, Crane's poetry um, and, and make them part of the history that the bridge tells. <coughs> uh, Crane uh, uh, might have had as one model for the inclusion of uh, African American expressive forms, surprisingly perhaps, Eliot. Uh, when, oh ho, that uh, Shakespearean rag, when that breaks into the wasteland, uh, jazz uh, and uh, a distinctively African American form also enters uh, Eliot's poem. <coughs> uh, Eliot was writing, however, from uh, the uh, uh, point of view of white Europe, uh, and blacks tend not to figure in his poetry uh, except perhaps as figures of otherness, uh, those uh, perhaps hooded hordes that swarm uh, across the plains uh, in the wasteland. <coughs> Uh, Beinecke includes in its Ezra Pound papers uh, an interesting selection of poems published with um, Eliot's Juvenilia not so long ago, um, uh, a selection of, of uh, uh, poems that circulated between Pound and uh, Eliot and certain other friends, which are uh, obscene racist uh, limericks uh, that Eliot wrote uh, about King Bolo and his big black bastard queen. Uh, this, is too, is part of Eliot's oeuvre, though not part of the public form of it, uh, and it's uh, important uh, 
uh, information uh, about at least one way in which um, black life figured in the high modernist uh, 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 imagination <coughs> of Eliot and others. Um, here's that photo I uh, started to show a, a moment ago. I, I suppose uh, Hughes is the only um <coughs> modernist poet who begins as a busboy. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, this is a, a photo from uh, 1925, uh, taken at the Wardman Park Hotel uh, for a newspaper uh, uh, story about Hughes. Uh, Hughes had been, it seems, discovered by the poet Vachel Lindsay at lunch uh, when uh, Hughes, or so the anecdote goes, presented his poems to Lindsay, uh, and Lindsay, uh, taken with them, went on to read them that uh, night at a reading Lindsay was giving. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this was all carefully orchestrated by Hughes. If he's a busboy, he is also a poet, and, wants and he's really, in a sense, almost in costume there, uh, imposing for the newspaper photos. <coughs> but it's, a, it's an interesting and uh, important uh, uh, image of the uh, uh, man Hughes was uh, as he began to write poems like The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Uh, if white poetry uh, turns away from African American people in their experience uh, in, in modernism, uh, Hughes also himself uh, intended to uh, turn away from white poetry. <coughs> Uh, the Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain, that prose piece I've asked you to read uh, at the end of uh, your anthology on 964, uh, makes this argument very forcefully. <coughs> uh, it begins by um, uh, Hughes contrasting uh, his own intention uh, as an artist uh, with that of uh, one of the most promising of the young Negro poets <coughs> who, um, as uh, Hughes interprets his ambition, uh, uh, wants to be like a white poet uh, and, in that sense, would like to be white. Uh, Hughes is uh, writing here uh, about County Cullen, uh, a uh, 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 rival artist uh, whose work you can sample on um, uh, page 727 uh, and uh, following in your anthology. <coughs> um, Hughes wants to get out of the curious condition uh, of wanting to uh, write white, so to speak, <coughs> uh, by redefining what it would mean to sing uh, in, in poetry. On, on 965, he, he um, uh, juxtaposes two, um, two black audiences. One, uh, what he calls uh, self-styled high-class Negroes <coughs> uh, that represent uh, bourgeois um, uh, norms or the aspiration to them <coughs> uh, and that seek uh, what Hughes calls Nordic culture. <coughs> uh, and he contrasts them uh, rather to uh, another uh, expression of, of black life with which he identifies himself. Uh, these are the low-down folks, the so-called common element, and they are the majority, he writes. May the Lord be praised. The people who have their nip of gin on Saturday nights and are not too important to themselves or the community or too well-fed, or too learned to watch the lazy world go round. They live on 7th Street in Washington or State Street in Chicago, and they do not particularly care whether they're like white folks or anybody else. Their joy runs bang into ecstasy. Their religion soars to a shout. Work may be a little today, rest a little tomorrow, play a while, sing a while, oh, let's dance. These common people are not afraid of spirituals, as for a long time their more intellectual brethren were, were and jazz is their child. Uh, and he continues. Uh, he juxtaposes ecstasy, shouting, jazz, uh, against what he calls here American standardizations. Uh, 
Uh, they, they furnish a wealth of colorful, distinctive material for any artist because they still hold their individuality, their individuality, in the face of American standard, standardizations. And perhaps these common people will give to the world its truly great Negro artist, the one who is not afraid to be himself, and which I, Langston Hughes, aspire to be. <coughs> um, these are important statements. Uh, they uh, show um, uh, Hughes's ambitions. Uh, they show him positioning himself in relation to another African American writer, uh, other uh, African American um, uh, audiences uh, for for culture. Uh, in making the move uh, that he is doing here, uh, a move that that's really deeply uh, um, influential in American literature and, and poetry. Uh, which as a whole descends from Hughes rather than from County Cullen. <coughs> uh, Hughes is still, however, doing something similar, after all, uh, to the other modern poets we've been reading in this course. And I want to suggest some of the continuities between Hughes uh, and uh, these other writers. <coughs> uh, like Yeats, uh, for example, Hughes wanted to be a representative figure, <coughs> to speak for a people. Uh, and we speak of uh, uh, the Irish Renaissance just as we speak of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, of which um, Hughes was a central figure. Like Williams, uh, like Moore, like Crane, and like Frost, uh, also uh, Hughes was very conscious of being an American poet. Um <coughs> Uh, eschewing uh, European examples, uh, for the most part, uh, and seeking to bring into poetry lives and language that had not been seen uh, previously as poetic material. Uh, at the same time, uh, like Pound and like Eliot, <coughs> Hughes was interested uh, in a long historical view, uh, and he makes links uh, between uh, people of different times and places in uh, what was a global vision for Hughes of history. Uh, like Crane, uh, Hughes published his first book uh, in 1926, The Weary Blues. Uh, like Crane, uh, Hughes is a, you, you could call him a second generation modernist. He's, uh, uh, you know, consciously coming after uh, figures like uh, Eliot uh, and Pound, uh, uh, Yeats, uh, and Frost, for that matter. <coughs> uh, this book, too, uh, is published by Knopf, Alfred Knopf, uh, publisher of Wallace Stevens' first book, Harmonium. Uh, so Crane, I mean, excuse me, so Hughes is in that way, very much part of the same New York poetry world in which, well, uh, uh, um, Stevens and um, Crane uh, and others are appearing. Like Frost, uh, Hughes wanted to get uh, vernacular speech into poetry. Uh, and like Frost, um, Hughes, for the most part, did not write for little magazines, <laughs> but rather popular ones, as, as I was suggesting. Uh, in fact, both Frost and Hughes went on to make a living in poetry and to have a kind of national fame, uh, a general readership uh, that really none of uh, our other poets did. <coughs> uh, like Pound, uh, like Yeats in the teens, uh, Hughes is uh, uh, is interested in what he calls a naked style, <coughs> uh, a kind of uh, ascetic aesthetic. Uh, like the other poets uh <coughs> we've been reading, Hughes is a city poet. He's a metropolitan poet. Uh, and he styles himself, as we've just seen, against uh, middle class tastes and norms and expectations. And Importantly, like the other moderns, uh, he finds no consolation in traditional religion, uh, even while he sometimes uh, works with spirituals uh, and, and often invokes uh, Christian motifs in his poetry. <coughs> 
Uh, in all these ways, uh, Hughes is, is, I think, helpful to read at this point in the semester, partly uh, because uh, his affinities with the other moderns, once you start to recognize them, uh, help us to see a, a kind of whole picture. <coughs> but then, uh, just having said that, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to start talking about Hughes's difference. Uh, if he is an American poet, uh, he is just as importantly an African American poet. Uh, if he is uh, an internationalist, like Pound and Eliot, uh, he's interested in the international struggle of the worker and the oppressed races. Uh, Hughes, this is uh, this is Hughes writing about a uh, uh, journey to Cuba that he made. Uh, he uh, traveled. Uh, it, particularly in the 30s, uh, frequently as a, as a kind of uh, representative of black uh, Americans uh, sponsored by um <coughs> left groups uh, and traveled to, uh, uh, well, Soviet Russia uh, among uh, other places. If Hughes's style is, is stripped down and, and naked, it is uh, used to describe uh, a people who have been stripped uh, of dignity and identity. If he's a city poet, uh, he is not a poet of the village uh, or of London, uh, but rather of Harlem. Uh, and uh, if, if God has withdrawn from the world of Hughes's poems, uh, God has, has uh, uh, has left people not to Eliotic uh, despair and uh, epistemological anxiety, uh, but rather to rape and murder. <coughs> uh, you might remember the, the last presidential uh, election. Do you remember that? Uh, uh, John Kerry, uh, always in search of a theme, <coughs> which he never quite found, uh, uh, seized for a little while on uh, the phrase, let America be America again. Sounds good. Uh, it's the title of a poem by Langston Hughes, which uh, Carey uh, also made note of um, uh, when he uh, referred to that, uh, um, when, he, when he quoted Hughes, um, which uh, uh, was resonant, uh, uh, which uh, uh, sounded uh, good in all sorts of ways, uh, and which had the added advantage of uh, letting Carey uh, uh, quote a black writer. <coughs> uh, but then, uh, as you, if you remember this, we'll also remember, uh, pundits uh, quickly pointed out that uh, this was uh, not a, a poem uh, nostalgic for uh, a golden era of democracy, uh, but rather a protest poem uh, about the inequities of American history. And it was written by a leftist who uh, um, uh, had ties to the Communist Party. Uh, <laughs> whoops. Uh, <coughs> this, is, uh, <coughs> this is Langston Hughes. Uh, that's a Russian script on the left, and there's Hughes in the middle, uh, surrounded by a variety of comrades. Uh, in, in uh, Russia in the 30s. And, and uh, alas, uh, this is not uh, what John Kerry wanted to project. <coughs> uh, or here is Hughes uh, with two uh, Soviet soldiers, uh, also from the 30s. Hughes is much photographed uh, in many different roles and uh, public uh, scenes. Uh, and there's a vast archive of his papers at Beinecke from which uh, these images come. Uh, although uh, Hughes's uh, uh, reputation is, is a little bit like Frost's uh, in, in having this, this general readership, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a poet you, you probably read even in elementary school, uh, he poses all sorts of political problems that Frost does not. Uh, well, uh, here is Hughes with somebody else. Uh, someone more acceptable to be photographed with, uh, W.C. Handy, uh, in some ways the father of the blues, as he's uh, uh, called, uh, and uh, a uh, uh, close friend of, of Hughes's. <coughs> uh, let me talk about Hughes and the blues. Here's a, an image of uh, 
illustration of Hughes's poem, Too Blue, by the African-American artist Jacob Lawrence. Uh, Hughes, uh, from the Weary Blues forward, um, frequently um, presents his poems as uh, forms of music, uh, as allied to, um, as uh, identified with, as perhaps metaphorical versions of uh, African-American forms, uh, particularly but not only the blues. Uh, later uh, in his career, his readings would sometimes be accompanied by music. Uh, in his best blues poems, uh, Hughes is um, Hughes is not um, it's not trying to write words for music, <coughs> I don't think, but rather uh, is trying to write poems uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, allude to uh, and and um, uh, let us hear in in metaphorical ways the musical traditions uh, which they are drawn on and the uh, culture and experience from which they come. Uh, Hughes, uh, at his most powerful, uses musical forms, popular musical forms, for effects of compression uh, and to develop really complex ironies, often through repetition, uh, uh, usually built out of the three-part structures of the blues. <coughs> Let's look uh, at um, the poem Song for a Dark Girl on 691. It is, um, like many of Hughes's poems, uh, it's a simple poem in its structure. Uh, and yet, uh, that simplicity uh, conveys uh, real verbal uh, complexity. Uh, and the poem, uh, in its popular mode, nevertheless invites uh, a kind of close reading uh, that we give to, uh, uh, that's demanded by uh, modernist poetry that presents itself as. Um, uh, compressed, imagistic, difficult, uh, and so on. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at it. Way down south in Dixie, break the heart of me. They hung my black young lover to a crossroads tree. Way down south in Dixie, bruised body high in air, I asked the white Lord Jesus, what was the use of prayer? Way down south in Dixie, break the heart of me. Love is a naked shadow on a gnarled and naked tree. This is a, a song for a dark girl, uh, suggesting um, uh, at once uh, words for her to sing, a dramatic monologue, uh, and also for in the sense of a kind of um, uh, homage uh, or tribute to her. <coughs> she is dark. Uh, as in uh, other Hughes poems, uh, the word here seems to mean black, uh, also darkened, uh, abused, grieving, shadowed. It's all held there in that simple word. Uh, way down south in Dixie, uh, a line from the minstrel refrain. <coughs> uh, it's borrowed here and adapted. Uh, Dixie is a kind of shorthand name for a system and history of oppression in this poem. Uh, and, and the, the very uh, jauntiness and pride of uh, a uh, uh, colloquial name like Dixie is, is played off of here the uh, melancholy and, and grief of the context. 
that phrase way down, that seems innocuous too, but isn't it resonant as, you, uh, as it is repeated and as we uh, feel our way into the poem? Uh, it's formulaic, uh, but it suggests that we're going, that this poem happens somewhere deep and dark, <laughs> somewhere away down, uh, somewhere in the heart, uh, in the heart of this system of oppression, but also, uh, as it will turn out, in the heart of uh, me as the poem develops it. Uh, here, the, fr the, the, the mere phrase, way down south in Dixie, uh, and, and the, 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 the mention of that name, uh, calling up the tune, uh, uh, summons uh, a kind of uh, history of uh, uh, oppression that would uh, occlude the kind of story that Hughes wants to bring forward uh, and tell here. Um, the minstrel phrase is taken up uh, by here a speaker who suffers, who is oppressed uh, by this system of oppression, uh, and she uses it to make her own music. Uh, as in other Hughes poems, repetition, <coughs> the use of the refrain, uh, uh, makes everything that happens seem inevitable. It evokes here uh, repeated uh, actions, uh, it, uh, uh, a kind of history of repeated acts. Uh, in general, uh, in the case of refrains, uh, we, we, uh, they, they function in a variety of ways. Uh, a refrain that comes last in a verse unit uh, would seem to convey the uh, idea that, well, somehow things always end this way. Uh, here, what we have is an, an instance of what we would call anaphora, that is uh, a refrain used to uh, initiate uh, a uh, uh, unit of verse. Uh, and the refrain is the, the first line of these stanzas, uh, and it seems to suggest that the story always, this kind of story always, begins the same way, way down in Dixie. This is the way into everything that's experienced in the poem, everything that's said. The parenthesis that comes then, uh, repeated in the second line of each of these stanzas, uh, functions in an interesting way. Uh, it suggests, I think, that, that what is being said in them uh, is a kind of aside uh, or some kind of interior reflection or soliloquy, uh, perhaps a, a voice that must be kept inside. <coughs> Does that first phrase, break the heart of me, uh, refer to the girl, uh, to her lynched lover, uh, or to the poet? Reflecting on both. Uh, probably the answer is all three, uh, held together in a system of identification. Uh, that phrase, the heart of me, is resonant. Uh, it is uh, what holds these three together, a kind of shared heart. Uh, it refers to the heart, meaning emotion, feeling, probably pride. Uh, but the phrase also suggests simply the center. Uh, the heart of me, uh, myself, my identity. Uh, they, they hung my black young lover to a crossroads tree. They is superbly vague, uh, impersonal, plural, formulaic, dehumanized, uh, evoking uh, a mob, <coughs> uh, a generalized body. Then there's that phrase, the crossroads tree. There are a lot of suggestions in it. Uh, first of all, it evokes the tree of the cross, Christ's cross. Uh, then uh, the cross is also uh, a figure for, uh, I think, the intersection of white and black, as it is on the, in the little poem called Cross uh, on the page before. You could uh, consult that. Uh, and then. The Crossroads is uh, it's one of the central recurrent scenes of the blues. It's, it's where Robert Johnson uh, 
the uh, blues man was said to have made his pact with the devil. Uh, it is the place where choices are made, uh, where crisis occurs in a wandering and, and displaced life. Uh, that second verse, way down south in Dixie, bruised body, high in air, I asked the white Lord Jesus, what was the use of prayer? Uh, now the parenthesis holds in it a kind of brutal image, something horrifying that must be set off slightly. Uh, the body is bruised. Uh, it shows the marks of beating, of suffering, uh, in advance of murder. Uh, it's lifted high in air, not in honor or tribute. Uh, rather, to be lifted in this way is to lose all agency, uh, to be made lifeless. Uh, all of this presented as a kind of syntactic fragment in the poem, uh, not yet integrated into the poem, so to speak, or it may be into not yet integrated into consciousness. Uh, the final verse will go back to it uh, and, and interpret that, that image. Here, Jesus is white uh, in the sense of pure, untouched, redeemed, uh, but also because he is, uh, it seems, a representative of white culture, a kind of mediator the girl uh, would seek to uh, address. Uh, the girl doesn't pray to him, but rather asks a question, a question about the use of prayer, and uh, Jesus notably doesn't answer. Uh, in addition to uh, repetition, um, uh, song form poems like this are made out of omission uh, and jumps uh, from one stanza to another, from one line to another. <coughs> and one thing admitted here is any sense of Jesus' reply, or perhaps the answer comes in the form of that final verse, uh, which repeats the first lines of the poem. Uh, this is the truth that it arises from and returns to. Uh, and it gives us a memorable image. Uh, the lover has become depersonalized and abstract, uh, merely a shadow. Uh, he is now, though, with his abstraction, become love itself. The girl's love, perhaps Christ's love. And love is a naked shadow on a gnarled and naked tree. Here, the repetition of naked uh, is suggestive. Uh, it evokes the, the man's nakedness, his helplessness and exposure. Uh, there's also a sense of revelation, of coming to uh, the naked truth. Uh, and this is something very different from the nakedness that Yeats boasts of in his poems. Uh, the blues is also about laughter. <laughs> uh, and uh, it is uh, laughter that I guess I would like to uh, end with uh, while we have a few moments left. Um, uh, laughter that um, uh, comes out of uh, the endurance of um, hardship uh, and suffering. Uh, this is a, a young Hughes laughing, and here's a later one. <laughs> uh, and why don't we end with a, a later poem? Uh, and that, that's called Life is Fine on 699, <coughs> 20 years uh, after the poems I've been uh, discussing. Uh, it, it too has a, a uh, a song form uh, and, and a uh, blues singer speaking to us. I went down to the river, and think of how many rivers appear in these poems. Uh, uh, I went down to the river, I sat down on the bank, I tried to think but couldn't, so I jumped in and sank. I came up once and hollered. I came up twice and cried. If that water hadn't have been so cold, I might have sunk and died. But it was cold in that water. It was cold. <laughs> Suicide is contemplated and tried. Uh, uh, not quite. 
because when the uh, 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 singer gets on top of the building, he decides, but it was high up there. It was high. And he's not about to jump. Since I'm still here living, I guess I will live on. I could have died for love, but for living, I was born, not for love, because <laughs> that would mean dying. You may hear me holler, you may see me cry, but I'll be dogged, sweet baby, if you're going to see me die. Life is fine, fine as wine. Life is fine. Well, I think rather than say anything else, uh, I'll uh, stop right on time uh, and uh, uh, promise to return on Wednesday to talk about William Carlos Williams. <laughs>